This is Dr. Margarita Curry, Dr. Red Shoe, The Shrink, and we have everyone's favorite rabbi. Jonathan Goldson. And the rabbi and I are delighted to have for the second time, Michael Mick Patrick Mulroy, who is a beautiful thinker. He's a stoic and he's a true American patriot. He is the former deputy assistant secretary of defense for the Middle East. Ta-da, welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me and happy new year. Well, happy new year to you. We believe that your message is key for 2022. What do you have to say about America and ethics? So I recently wrote a paper uh, along with Adam Piercy and Donald Robertson, two uh, fellow Stoics, uh, that follow the Stoic philosophy, I should say, um, that was about integrity and honor when it comes to the nation. Um, we wrote it specifically about Afghanistan and the way we left Afghanistan, uh, which even if you agreed that we should leave, I think uh, the way we did uh, left uh, a lot more that should have been done. Uh, and then I, you know, it's up to you, it's your, pod, it's your podcast, but if we want to talk about how uh, integrity uh, of a nation should play into how we deal with the authoritarian regimes of the world, I, I'd point that out. And then lastly, I think we need to talk about um, the extremist movements in the United States and how the average citizen uh, has a role in, in pushing back against that. Well, let's start at the beginning. What is it integrity and what does it have to do with being a good American citizen? So the way integrity, and first of all, as you mentioned, I'm a stoic, but this, you know, whether you gain your belief in integrity and integrity system from a religion, from a philosophy, other than stoicism, or your mom, um, I, I think of we're all on the same sheet of music on what integrity is. And the way I've always defined it is doing the right thing, even if nobody's watching, right? That's the way my parents defined it. That's the way the Marine Corps defined it. Uh, and I think that's how uh, most people, when you say it that way, understand both components, doing the right thing. Um, and then and even when nobody's watching is kind of the epitome, I think, of stoicism uh, in integrity. So I think that is one of the things about the United States uh, that not only Americans like, but people around the world, is we have always been a beacon of freedom. We have always put the promotion of individual liberties, human rights, and democracy as first and foremost international security policy. And I think we need to continue to do that. You, know, you, you touched on some really um, foundational ideas right there. Um, you know, I, I always come back to uh, Professor Stephen Carter's observation that integrity comes from the word integer, which is a whole number. To have integrity means to be a whole person. It's consistency, not just promoting ideas, but living them. And um, you, know, you also made a point that it's not enough to do the right thing. It's how we do the right thing. And when we, when we look at all the different facets of human behavior, um, there are just so many elements that come together. If you, and I'm going into all sorts of different metaphors right now, but uh, you know, the, the, the Hebrew word shalom is normally translated as peace, but a better translation would be harmony. And harmony is when all the pieces fit together. A symphony has different instruments playing different notes at different times, but when it's done properly, it fuses together into a single orchestral presentation. And I think that really cuts to the heart of what is integrity as an individual and as a people, is we can have different ideas. We can be passionate. We can fight tooth and nail, but there has to be that sense that we are one people, that we have a common idea a common mission, a common set of values. That's what brings us together. That's what makes a successful society. Absolutely. Very well said, Rabbi. So what you said, that's what I would say we need to focus on for the new year. And, you know, it's, it's pretty early in the year. So there's a lot of people who are making resolutions. And, and I think that should be most of our 
resolutions is that we should work together uh, to promote um, this idea of national honor and integrity. Yes. Uh, honor sometimes is a, is a loaded word, but that's why I'm instead using, I, even on the paper we used honor uh, that I wrote on Afghanistan, uh, but integrity, because a nation's integrity comes from the actions of its people and the actions of its leaders. Uh, and when you make a promise to somebody, uh, keeping it is one of the core tenets of your integrity. Uh, you can't treat anybody. And, and there used to be this adage that, you know, there's no friend in foreign policy. I just totally disagree with that. Uh, you need to rely on friends and they need to rely on you. And whether it's an alliance like NATO or whether it's a partnership like we have with, in the case of the paper we wrote on Afghanistan, the partners that stood with us for 20 years fighting, um, you need to be a country of your word or that will be remembered by both your allies and your adversaries alike. And I think that is something that we fell far short of uh, during the exit of Afghanistan. And um, although that decision is made and those things happened, we have an opportunity to, to still make it right, to still do everything we can to get the people we promised out of Afghanistan, which has turned into a completely authoritarian, uh, almost dystopian state, um, and get them the, here, which is what we promised, and resettled in the United States. So uh, I know that's a specific thing, but I do think it's gonna define in many ways the way the United States is looked on, on around the world. And as a people, whether you agreed with going to Afghanistan and whether you agreed with leaving or staying, um, we still did make an obligation to a set of people who fought and uh, by my estimates, some 60,000 died fighting alongside of us in the last 20 years. We still did make a promise to them Yes. And we have an obligation to keep it. We do. The rabbi and I love what you're saying. The reason we started this podcast in the first place is that we realized that maybe America need a little help in speaking up the right way, thinking about things in an effective and ethical way, and doing right action. And I'm thinking now maybe you can address that. What can each American do, an American ally, to help? freedom and to help our integrity be the beacons of not only this year, but of our future? Well, the first thing's voting. And I know uh, that's kind of uh, the answer everybody says, but if you believe in what we stand for, and I, I think most Americans do, um, then actively seek people that are going to promote that on both sides of the aisle. Uh, you know, I'm a nonpartisan, apolitical person, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not here to push any, any side. I'm here to push our side, right, which is to promote this around the world. I, and we talked about it before the podcast. I think there's an exceptional book. I don't know the author. Uh, her name's Anne Applebaum. It's called The Twilight of Democracy. And it really talks about how the world is lurching back to authoritarianism. Even some people that would term themselves and maybe others as intellectuals are finding reasons to support um, an anti-democratic authoritarian regime uh, for their own purposes. And it is up into your question, it is up to every American who doesn't want to see that to realize that the United States is the force in opposition to that. We are the you know, essential superpower, if you will, to push back against this surge in authoritarian regime, whether it's China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, or just keep going down the list. These are places where individual human rights don't exist, period. The United States and a lot of our allies are what's gonna push back against that. And we have an obligation in my opinion, that's why I'm attaching it to integrity. It's our national integrity to be that big. So let me play devil's advocate for a moment. Let me say that I agree with everything you said, which in fact I do. But what if I say that, you know, it's a great idea. It sounds wonderful. It just isn't realistic. We can't afford to be the policemen of the world. We can't afford, we have, we have to spend money on our problems here at home. 
We don't want to put our young men and young women's lives on the line. And while it's a nice idea, it just isn't realistic. We have to deal with our own priorities first. What's your response to that? Well, first of all, Rabbi, I think we are going to get to the problems at home. So I think that's, uh, that's going to be you know, the next part of our discussion. But I, first of all, I think, or second of all, I think you make a good point. So if we can agree that we should stand for this uh, democracy and individual liberties and human rights, then the question is, what does that mean, right? Does that mean we become the police of the world? And there's a good argument to say, you know, in the last 20 years, we spent trillions of dollars and, you know, lost a lot of lives and it wasn't that scope. So I, 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 I'm the first one to recognize the argument against being the police of the world, as you said. So I think we have to, we have to uh, look at how we do what I just said we should do, which is to be this beacon. The answer is probably not going to be to invade a country and try to uh, topple a regime and then create a democracy. Um, one, it just doesn't seem to work. So even if it is a noble effort, um, it has proven in practicality uh, not necessarily to be successful. Um, I would argue that uh, we did, even though I was personally against going into Iraq. Uh, we have a democratically elected government in Iraq now, uh, and we're still there in support. I would also point out that we still have an obligation when it comes to those who seek to attack us, um, that we need to do things like go into Syria, work with the people on the ground in Syria and defeat a group like ISIS, for, for uh, example. But I do think we need to look at how we do this going forward. Is it that we actively promote democracies? Maybe we use our uh, national economic strength to do that, right? So maybe we start focusing our efforts on, on foreign aid and development on those that are pushing human rights for their people. I mean, that's another way of looking. It doesn't all have to be military, I guess is what I'm, I'm saying. We can focus our diplomacy, which should be the number one thing we do, way before we use military, on promotion of democracies, and our like-minded people around the world. The second thing is our economic law, and we can do that by promoting development and aid into societies that, that uh, um, promote our same values. And then the third, and I think last resort, is action, whether it's military or covert from my background. But that should be the last. But to your point, it, we should look at how we do this, because it, it's easy to say, you know, we should, we should do this around the world, um, but you have to make it fit into practical terms. And that doesn't necessarily mean using our military against every authoritarian dictator. It's not necessarily successful and it's not, it's not really the right answer. So I have, um, I've been talking to lots of people. I just did a long car trip, which speaks to my lack of mental wellness, really. 20 hours in the car with uh, kids and dogs. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but we met a lot of people from all around the United States and even different nations at the different rest stops and stuff. And I was asking about uh, what they thought was important for the year. And I even asked, um, what does ethics have to do with how you live your life this year? Uh, I know I looked like a crazy lady, but that's okay. I like the crazy grandma in, in Moana. She works for me. <laughs> I got some answers from people from all around the world that says we need to all be stronger individually. I like that. But then I got some disturbing responses, many from Americans, that it doesn't matter what we do because what we say, no one listens to. And some were saying, even like oh, the issue of wearing masks, that we become, they were saying that we become just um, puppets and that it's like a communistic uh, nation being told what to do and we have to do it whether we agree with it or not. Clearly that did not sit well with me as someone who escaped communism of, of Castro. Uh, I didn't fight back. I was there just to listen. Rabbi, I did well, I did not argue. I just had my big ears on listening. And I asked more questions and maybe they thought I agreed or didn't agree, but I just listened and asked. What do you have to say to these Americans who say it doesn't matter what they do? So I first start by commending you for listening. Um, <laughs> it was hard. Thank you. It, it is. It is hard sometimes. Uh, 
again, I already mentioned I'm an apolitical person, but I, I have I have friends on both sides of the aisle. Um, some of them are a little further out than I, quite frankly, would have expected. Uh, and I do a lot of listening because I, if I start talking, um, it'd probably be it turned into an argument, <laughs> right? So listening to understand their perspective, you obviously don't have to agree with it, is important. I would, I would, in that discussion, ask them to do the same, right? Where they can potentially listen to you or somebody, somebody else. So first of all, the Americans who think we're in some kind of situation of authoritarianism know nothing of authoritarianism. <laughs> They've never had the experience that you just referenced of living in communist Cuba or communist China or uh, Russia, uh, current day Russia, or a lot of the other dictator dictatorial uh, countries on earth. So uh, I would just, that's why maybe, uh, that's one of the reasons why I advocated reading that book, The Twilight Empire democracy. They need to understand that they have a lot more than they think they do in the United States. They literally have the ability to say whatever they want, even if it's extraordinarily um, misinformed about the government. I mean, that should tell you you don't live in an authoritarian state. I mean, right now in China, if you say stuff against the, the government, your social score goes down. You can't even get a loan. If they consider you a threat just because of your religion, you get incarcerated. There's over a million Uyghurs in what we would call uh, camps. Um, they are camps, they're prisons, essentially, in China. So you need to realize that that isn't the case in the United States, and, and you may might need to have, a to those who think it is, a reality check. The other thing I would say to people is it's easy for the middle you know, middle of the centrist of the United States just to cut both sides out and say, you know, it just gives me a headache. Uh, you know, I watched the documentary that was recommended to me on one of the conspiracy groups. Uh, and quite frankly, it gave me a headache. I couldn't, it was hard to even get through it. It's an obligation, I think, of those uh, of Americans to, to understand their perspective, and to have the courage to actually talk back against it. I don't mean arguing, but it's easy just to say, you know what, I'm not even gonna engage in this. The problem is it's not going away. And there's extremist groups on both sides the, uh, in the United States, on the far right, on the far left, um, that need to be addressed. Not just because they're promoting bogus ideas, but their ideas are turning into violent action. Whether it's you know an assault on the Capitol or a burning of a police station, uh, that's unacceptable. And as a society, uh, we can, as you both so eloquently said, disagree, and that's the right, you have a right to disagree, and you should uh, be okay with that as an American, but you don't have the right to conduct violent acts. And that's where people need to stop start saying stuff now and start being more, in, in the stoic terms, courageous. Because courageous isn't just being a soldier or, or a Marine. It is being a civil rights activist. It is being the person that pushes back against those who want to bring us back into a time uh, of which um, certain people weren't welcome in the United States. That is courage and that is part of integrity. And that I think is on every American uh, as much as it just might give you a headache and you don't want to engage, I think you have. We pointed out before that uh, courage is the C in ethics. And you know, courage can take different forms. Courage can be standing up in the face of danger or objection, confrontation. It can also be standing up even though it appears that I can't make a difference. And I have the courage to live my integrity, to live my values, to promote them, even when it seems pointless. And, and I emphasize it seems pointless because I think one of the really serious challenges, and, and I'm getting to the point where I think it may be our biggest challenge, is that we have a media that promotes a vision of America as a society at war against itself. And the danger is that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
if, if it appears that we are divided into militarized camps that absolutely refuse to have anything to do with each other, then that promotes the taking of sides. And, and I believe I have a friend who's a truck driver and he says that he stops and he talks to people as you did, uh, doctor. And he said that most people that he meets are good, decent people who don't have extreme viewpoints, who don't want to engage in, in the politics of, of extremism. And if, if the majority still yearn for that sense of consensus and moderation, why do we feel like we are, are, are on, on the road to destruction and self-destruction? And then the courage to persevere and to, and I like to call it the passionate moderation, um, which doesn't necessarily mean planting a flag in the middle somewhere. It just means moderating our rhetoric, moderating our dialogue. Um, you know, doctor, is there a psychological uh, explanation or, or approach to interpreting uh, this or, 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 or to suggesting a solution to it? Well, I think that a lot of people like to think about, like you wrote the book, Grappling with the Gray. Who wants to grapple with a gray if they don't want to think about things? Gray is messy. So it's better to just think about someone in your past or someone in your present and follow them, whether they're all the way um, one end of the continuum or the other, whatever color we make those. I don't want to make it black and white because those are those colors are tricky. Um, but at the end of the gray continuum, right, all the way non-gray and all the way super gray. Um, I think that people are scared to think. They're scared to be wrong. They want to be liked. It's a lot of work, and they don't always know who to who to believe. So we asked you and I were talking to Mick before. We said, so how do we get the information? to support decisions and conversations that make sense. Who do we trust with what's really happening in America and globally? That question for me? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Yeah. Sorry. Well, first of all, to the rabbi's point, perseverance was a word from last time. So uh, that's a good, good link in, I think. Um, and and a, a point on the rabbi's comments, and I'll get to that, uh, Doc. The, the issue of extremist groups in the United States and these, in this political polarization, whether you consider, most people consider themselves in the middle, I've noticed, even though you're like, wow, you're really not in the middle. They, they somehow think they're in the mainstream. I would only ask everybody, wherever you think you sit, to take time to listen to the other side. You know what it is, you know where to find it. Go ahead and without, yelling at the TV without, you know, just, and I have to give credit to my business partner. You know, we keep the news on because we are analysts. He makes us keep switching from news <laughs> channels. So we get it all. Um, I, would, I, would public, I would advocate for people to do that. Listen to the other side um, without comment, <laughs> without talking over. And one, you need to know uh, what they think and two, it gives you a different perspective. If you only listen to what reinforces your beliefs, then you're going to get more and more extreme in your beliefs, in my opinion. So who do, who, so Margarita, who should we uh, listen to? From a Stoic's perspective, and you know, they have that four main principles, principles. One of them is wisdom. And wisdom isn't just being a smart person. I mean, yes, it's part of it being, you know, intellectual and reading and learning and listening. But it's also the willingness to understand when you're wrong. So if somebody told you something and it fit your pre, you know, sorry, there's my there's somebody building something in the back of my house. So if it, if you're hearing that, I apologize. I thought it was a good uh, side effect uh, for what you were talking about. Yeah, nobody's breaking into my house. It was brilliant. Uh, yeah, um, but wisdom means your willingness to learn new things and accept when what you thought was right is not and that is the core of i think what would make political discourse in the united states you have to be willing to sit because you know it's almost like now um each side
side of the political spectrum just gives a list of what you should believe and you have to accept it. Why? I mean, there's very few people that would take a, a platform from any party or no party at all and believe everything in it. So why be in the park? Why not just decide for yourself on every individual issue? And, and, and look at both sides. Don't just take it from some, I say talking it on TV, but I guess I haven't talked it on TV. Don't take it from us. Just read, listen to a lot of people and, and come up to your own conclusion. And don't do it pre you don't do it based on what particular group you happen to identify with. Be your own person and be your own thinker. So stoicism is that. It, stoicism doesn't tell you what to say. It tells you that you should take all steps available to you to, to come up with what you think. Well, one thing, Rabbi and, um, and Mick, uh, as a psychologist, I had the experience of dealing with people who had joined cults, which is to me the total opposite of what we're all thinking is the wise thing to do. So they pick one person with an interesting delusion or point of view that's not based on reality. Uh, they, they get a message from a galactic something. They become somehow a god or demigod. And, and then amazingly bright people follow them. That to me is alarming. How does that happen? And I think you both are talking with me about a solution to that. Understand the cults, understand this extreme point of view, that extreme point of view and all the middles. And then somehow you have to have the courage because it's messy, it's scary to really decide, well, what do I really believe? Not just what my family believes or what the rabbi believes or what Mick believes, but what do I really think? And that's hard work. I, I think that's hard work. I'll so what you do you all say to that? What can we, how can we provide more courage and more guidance to the people who are maybe ready to take the plunge to see what do they really believe in view of lots of information? I want, to, I want to riff on something you said for a second. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Because when I was in seminary, um, you know, from time to time, our, our, our rabbis would be asked, you know, are, are you engaging in brainwashing? So one of my rabbis said, no, we don't, we don't wash brains here. We dry clean them. <laughs> and, and well, it's clever. Um, but what he went on to say is that here we encourage asking questions. And we don't encourage simply accepting answers. If you don't like the answer, keep pushing. If you don't understand the answer, keep arguing. There's nothing disrespectful about saying, I don't understand your point of view. If you say it politely, or as doctor you like to say, could you please help me understand better where you're coming from? But it's that willingness to challenge and be challenged. And, and, and to your other point, Mick, when you talk about um, sort of being in lockstep with a, with a platform, um, I think one of the things, we've talked about this before we, we went on air, that you know we don't live in America, we don't live in a true democracy. We live in a democratic republic. And that means that we don't vote for policies, we vote for people. Well, who are the people that we want to vote for? People who have integrity, because if you have integrity, you're trusted. We want to trust our leaders, and we don't. And that's really the crisis in confidence that we have right now. That's why we feel like it's a lost cause. That's why we become ideological and extremist, because, well, I can't trust the people. I just have to pick a side. Yes. Uh a lot of points there and a lot of good points. It's, it's almost a philosopher king kind of concept. So first the doc's point on, on cults. You know, I'm not even gonna mention the group because I was, I don't wanna, you know, incidentally promote them. <laughs> but I watched this documentary on a cult that uh, by their um, calculation, if you added all the Lutherans, Methodists and uh, Presbyterians in the United States together, um, they still outnumber them now, which is a scary thought, right? So there's millions of them, apparently, according but to- But they left the Catholics out and we like to make babies, so this is good. Yeah, yes, you have the Irish component. And we do like to make 
a lot of Irish. Um, I can say that, obviously, I name Michael Patrick, my Lord. Um, but the point being is there's cult, what I think most people would call cult in the United States right now that are significant and they're having a massive effect on our politics and the stuff they believe. I mean, it's unbelievable to be able to put it that way. And I think Americans should educate themselves on that. Uh, but the, to the rabbi's point, yeah, I understand how people say, you know, I'm not going to vote for anybody because they all, I think, lack integrity. I would say, find somebody that does, ask them to run, run yourself, um, pick the best, because what's happening is that people, some people are just opting out, and the only people that are getting elected are the people that the, I think, the extreme sides are, are voting for. And so we're getting an extraordinarily polarized country. Um, another interesting uh, phenomenon that I learned through uh, ABC News, actually, I'm a, a security analyst, but I, I listen to the political analyst. Uh, in the United States, people have decided to actually live where people think politically like them. So if you go back to the, the 80s, uh, most congressional districts were somewhat split. Um, you'd have, you know, 45, 55 Republican, 45, 55 Democrat. So regardless of what side you were on or what party you were in, you still had to pay attention to the 45% that weren't in your party that were in your district. Now they're way skewed. So it's like 80, 20, either way. So they don't, they don't even listen to the other side. So you're getting people that have to play to the base of each side and they tend to be the more extreme sides of the party, both ways. Uh, so when they get, uh, and again, I'm not a political analyst, but I, I certainly do trust the political analyst who told me this. You're getting those people going to Washington and then they're, they're going there at complete loggerheads with one another. So they are much more inclined to do nothing than to do anything that would benefit the other side. So um, how do we change that? Well, we're not going to change the you know, migration, internal migration patterns of America. But I would say we have to start pushing for people that have integrity, that are going to do what's right for the country before their own you know, political future. So uh, again, I'm tying all this to integrity where those uh, political um, personalities that are willing to do things that are against their own political interests is what I count as those with integrity on either side of the political life. Um, they should go in there with the idea that they're promoting um, the policies that they believe in and that they stated. And if that those policies for some reason get them uh, unelected, they should just be okay with that. And just say, roger that, I'll go get a, another job. Uh, that is what I think we should be looking at for our political leadership and our policy leadership, but isn't necessarily the same. Um, the policy, the people who make policy in the U.S. are mostly in the executive branch, and quite frankly, most of them are not elected. They are, they are appointed and they're career professionals. But they need to go in there with the idea that the policies that they're promoting support the good of the United States internally. And how can our listeners help these policy um, reviewers and makers um, that are going to help us with this internal challenge to the United States and its um, functioning um, to keep away from extremism to uh, remember that we're all part of that beacon of freedom. What can we each do? So we talk about voting. We talk yes. about speaking out against extremism. Uh, on either side, and I would plug this. If you if you consider yourself on one side of the aisle, then you should talk about the extremists on your side of the aisle, <laughs> right? It, it, I mean, it, if you want to actually have any say, if you're on the right or the left, you need to talk about the extremists on your side because you'll have most more say in that. And then the last thing I'd say is the first cr credential for anybody you're voting for is integrity, right? They, they can be... They can be aligned with you in policies, but if they're not good people, good men or good women, um, find somebody else. Find somebody else. That's what I would say. And if if you think you are somebody who has the right integrity, and you know, I'm, you know, it's, it's a good place to make a point. I, I practice a stoic philosophy. I don't consider myself the greatest stoic 
at all. I consider myself an ever trying to improve stoic. Uh, and I know that's the way a lot of people view religion. It's not about being the perfect person. It's about trying to be better. And I think everybody's better off when everybody tries to be better. So if you think you're on that path, then maybe you should look at uh, whether it's you know the school board or local city council or Congress or the Senate. Um, try to be the person that pushes for people with integrity before anything else is our elected leaders. And what are some of the things to look at? Uh, the rabbi and I have been dismayed by how we think we see certain things and we identify that this person may not have integrity. So maybe you could make it really simple. What are the signs of integrity or lack thereof? Because well, I think people yeah. miss them. Yeah, so I mean, for me, this, this is simple because it is, is it, it, there's the, uh, the four principles of stoicism, right? Wisdom, justice, courage, and temperance. Right? Temperance or moderation is, everybody understands when you say the first three, but they're like temperance, what does that mean? Well, it means not being extreme. It means not being excessive. Um, and, you know, I know a lot of people that that fourth one is the one they're most challenged with, to be honest, whether it is an actual temper um, or whether it's, you know, overindulging on things, to be quite frank. Um, but to, to say them collectively is what they should look for in people that is going to be their leaders, I think is, is what amounts to integrity, right? If you take them all together. So that's, that is what I'm saying they should look for. Somebody who's willing um, to, to work together, somebody who's willing to understand when they're wrong and change their perspective, and someone who's willing to just to say, you know what, I know this is wrong and I'm not going to go along with it just so I can keep my office. That's courage. That's moral courage, right? It's, it's not necessarily the, you know, the Marine guarding the gate or John Lewis on the bridge courage, but it's basic courage, right? It's, it's what I think we can all do to say, I identify that this is something that is right and I'm going to do it even if, you know, for some reason it, it hurts my career. You know, again, it's, it's what I'm calling basic courage. It's not life and limb. It's just doing the right thing, even though it might not necessarily be the, the right thing for you professionally. You know, if we surround ourselves with people who have that type of integrity, then they hold us accountable. And we start expecting more from ourselves because we want to continue to be welcome in their company. Um, I, I think it was Tip O'Neill, maybe it was before that, uh, who said that all politics is local. And I think that part of the, I think today all part of, all part of politics is national or, or even global. Uh, we're, we're much more focused on the national level than we are on what's going on in our own backyard. And, and I think what you're saying, Mick, is that that's, that's a good place to start. I mean, maybe I can't influence a national election, but maybe I can have some influence over what's going on in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Even if I can't, if I, like, for instance, in my district, uh, um, my, my, my wife in particular gets fulminating over our, our representative who doesn't have to care about us because we're not in her demographic. And so there's no response. There's no interest, there's no explanation. And so, so even below the, 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 uh, the congressional level, the city level, the neighborhood level, the school board, there are areas where we can have our voices heard. And if I promote a message of integrity, you're giving me two candidates to vote for, neither one of them has integrity, I will not be forced to vote for the lesser of two evils. I'll vote for a third party candidate. I'll, I'll somehow take a stand. And then when other people hear me say that, instead of saying, well, you vote third party, that's a wasted vote. No, you reject, you reject a choice that's not a choice. And if more people hear that, then more of us may start thinking that way. I agree. And most people that say if you vote third party, 
you throw away your vote are part of the other two parties, <laughs> right? Because if, if more people voted third party, we'd have more parties and you'd have more options. So um, um, that's what I would say to that. I think it's a very rational answer. I'd also point out that I totally agree with your point on local. Everything is in politics, right? You can do a lot for your community that's not necessarily politics, right? It's, it, there's, I mean, youth, right? There's a lot of kids that are left out, period. Um, either because they're economic uh, situation or they have a single mother who has to work all day. And you can do a lot to, to change society for the better. Uh, and you can do it through integrity and you because you can promote that when you're dealing with, uh, you know, if you're volunteering at the boys club or girls club or, or whatever it is that you think is, is something valuable to do or coaching or anything like that. So I do think it's important that we do promote uh, through the political system, those that we think have integrity. But I'd also point out that they, it's not all about, you know, national politics because um, that's important, but there's a lot more that, that you can do. And that is on the local level. Uh, and it's, it's also, you know, promoting the values that, that I think we all would say we hold true. Wow. Yes, it's amazing. Well, I think we've gotten to the time when uh, the rabbi is going to do a word of the day, and then we'll come back to you, sir, um, and you will do some final words of wisdom for us. Um, rabbi, what is the word of the day, sir? Well, the word of the day, I'd like to introduce this with a short story from one of the great wise men of our times. I love your stories. Alfred the Butler. <laughs> who in one of the uh, Batman movies, he, he says how he was uh, um, in the military and in, in the jungles of Africa. And there was this tribal warlord that they were trying to get to cooperate. And they gave him this big box of jewels to pay him off. So he'd do what they wanted. And they found that the, he just kept doing what he wanted. And they found that the, the box of jewels had just been abandoned. He didn't even keep the bribe. And he said, some people just want to see the world burn. There are people like that. I don't think there are that many people like that. And the distinction, I think one of the problems that we have today is that we vilify people who disagree with us. If you don't think like I do, you're evil. And if you're evil, I don't have to talk to you. There's no point in talking to you. I, don't, I shouldn't compromise with you. You're the enemy. And I am justified to oppose you in any way possible. And so the word of the day is invidious. Invidious, which means calculated to create ill will or resentment or give offense. Offensively or unfairly discriminating. I saw this word recently used in an article by, uh, I think it was David French, who said that there are different types of discrimination. In other words, you discriminate who gets to go into the locker room, males or females. You discriminate who gets to play basketball. Short people tend not to be gain interest into the NBA. It's not because there's some sort of a conspiracy or a plot. It's not because we want to discriminate. It's just the nature of the situation. And what we really want to, what to, what we want to object to is invidious discrimination, discrimination for reasons that have no basis. And that, you know, even the word discrimination, we want to be able to discriminate between differences that are substantive differences. And it doesn't make us racist, doesn't make us biased, doesn't make us, um, this doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't warrant that we be tarred with the label of, of discrimination. To be discriminating, to recognize that not everyone who dis disagrees with us is invidious, then now we can start to talk to each other. If I see that you have a position that's thought out, that comes from a place of good intentions, now we can talk. Now we can understand each other better. 
And maybe we'll find that our differences are not quite as extreme as we thought they were. Bravo. Well said. So Mick, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, we really do, uh, we're grateful for your wisdom, for your insights. And uh, is there a final thought you'd like to leave us with? Well, first of all, if you happen to did hear all the noise, uh, sorry about that. It was literally, when we started, the, the, my guy that was helping me with something showed up and now we just drove away. <laughs> it was almost like perfectly tied for our bosses. I bought it there. Um, I guess my, my, my last thing is really to just highlight everything you talked about today. Integrity. Hold yourself accountable first, right? Be harder on yourself than you are other people. Listen to them, challenge them, challenge yourself. Uh, try to make a difference. Elect people who will promote what we think collectively is the right way to be. Um, keep your promise as a nation, or we're not gonna be able to promote it because people won't believe it. And then have the courage to stand up against those inside the United States who want to polarize the country uh, and take us away from the principles of which we're founded upon. Uh, so it is all the things I mentioned, all the principles that make up the integrity of the person and the country. And I think we all have an obligation to hold ourselves accountable and to promote uh, those uh, in the nation. I think that's a great message because you know, it's easy to point fingers across the aisle and blame people on the other side. But if I hold myself accountable and I hold my side accountable, then there's at least room to start working, to start solving problems instead of perpetuating them. So thank you for that message. And doctor, what is your last word? Well, my last words of the day is that I encourage everyone first to look up Mil uh, uh, Mick Mulroy's um, website. And I think that if you go um, anywhere, you see behind him is Lo the Lobo, the wolf. He is wolf, not a lone yeah. wolf. He is part of a great tribe of individual thinkers. It's the Lobo Institute is his website. I urge you to go there. And then I urge you to go back. This is 2022. I know some people say there's no magic in new beginnings. And I say, bah humbug, there is. Because there's an energy of renewal as a do-over, a fresh start. With the rabbi and the shrink, our whole idea is to help all of us, including the rabbi and I and all our guests, think about things ethically. Talk about things in ways that further the ethical education and understanding that we all have and to create opportunities for right action. So I'm gonna sign off with everyone to have an ethical 2022 and I've started off well, look, at I have a rabbi and I have a patriot who knows how to do policy and think about things. I'm off to a good start. I just have to not mess it up and maybe even make it even better by my effort and my courageous thinking. I urge everyone to have at least 10 minutes a day to think about what makes sense for them to do ethically and how can they help themselves and others, uh, making sure that the world is a better place and Americans, we have a free country. We have a good start to, to have a big difference. So let's not mess that up. Until the next episode of The Rabbi and the Shrink, you can check us out at podcast at The Rabbi and the Shrink, and please send us questions. Everyone, be well. <laughs>